this um this notion of you being notion i mean the reality of you being a very personal comedian uh-huh. and writer was that always your plan to make a comedy about the intimate details from your life yeah i mean i've been doing stand up 17 years and when i started it was not in vogue to do that but it was of course years and years before me but i think things come in waves it's mm-hmm. not like i invented it you know But when I was starting out, it was the one-liners was the big hot thing to be doing, and it was the easiest way to get on TV and blah, 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 blah. And then it kind of came back into fashion to do more personal stuff. But I honestly always laugh at that because, well, first of all, when I first started doing stand-up, I had written some very terrible jokes. (laughs) And then I got to my first gig, and something told me, don't say these. These are terrible. And so I started – I just told a story – that I thought, I don't know if it'll be funny, but it's going to be so embarrassing. I bet it'll get something, some kind of reaction. You threw away the script in your first attempt on stage? Yeah, and then that became how I organically worked. But I think it wasn't some brave thing. It it made me more scared to do the jokes that I had worked so hard on. Mm. Because if those hadn't worked, I think that would have killed me as opposed to, well, look, I just improvised what I'm saying, so if that doesn't go well... Hey. How did you start getting on stage? I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of courage, I think, to be a stand-up I, comedian. I to get up there by yourself. You don't think it does? No. Because if you are one, our mentality is so different than people who don't do it. If it took that much courage, we would not do it. We are not courageous people. That's the myth. We are to stay You don't think in- it's brave to stand no. in front of a bunch of people and say, no. look, I'm auditioning for your laughs? No, because we don't think of it that way. We think of it as... I have this thing to say. I think you guys might agree. Mm. And I think for me, when I hear people say comics need validation, I don't think we need human validation, like, please love me. I think it's more, I just, you know, if I had an experience with road rage or something, I just behaved this way. I need to tell you guys, I want to see, if you laugh, that means you've done that too. Mm. And that kind of feeling. So I don't, I mean, I think we're brave to stay in it. I think certain things that people don't realize go on behind the scenes are, are brave to put up with. Um, but the actual getting on stage is the, uh, it's the best part of the journey, especially if you're traveling and dealing with things and that it just You've like, you never once had stage fright or nervousness. No, or no, like no, that. no, no. I didn't wow. have the old Woody Allen throwing up before going on. Yeah. And, and it sounds like the subtext of what you seem to be saying is that you almost see yourself more as a storyteller than just a yuckster. No, because I don't like that label either, because then I think Which people, one? Which label don't you like? Uh, storyteller. Okay. Because I feel like people... Because to me, stand-up has always been storytelling, and the people who ruined it were the, the one-linery people. <laughs> and so for me, if I stay on a subject for three minutes, I'm called a storyteller. But I might have ten jokes on not wanting kids. If I do them all in a row, sometimes that gets mislabeled as a story. Mm. Um you know, and if you do a late night set. But, it, but when you talk about things happening in your, in your life and yeah. you're wanting to share them with folks yeah. who might have something similar, that's a very, that's not Stephen Wright. No, that's not Stephen I mean, Wright. It's, so, it, so that's, that's more, not sort of one liners. That's it's that, more narrative, I guess. Yes. I would say, yeah, there's definitely a narrative and a theme, but it's definitely not like Mike Verbigli, a brilliant storyteller. I would call him a storyteller. I think he calls himself that because he has a big thing waiting for you at the end where mm. mine have jokes kind of more throughout without the big finish you also don't i mean from my um scouring of the uh of the internet on yeah. your work and, 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 and various youtube clips and and, and your, your record you're not big on pop culture references of the moment no. you seem like you're you're you talk about life in almost a timeless way like the the, the things you talk oh, about could, timeless i love that well it's true i mean you know the, the questions of divorce or marriage or yeah. having a kid these are not new questions and they're not going to be uh they're still going to be relevant 20 years from now yeah yeah is it con- Conscious that you avoid pop culture references? It's not, but I guess if you asked me, the benefit of it is that I don't have to keep changing my act every <laughs> week, you know, so um, I can keep working on the same act and making it better, making it stronger, and adding jokes. I think, which is why it's hard for me to listen to material that I did six months ago because I know I've made it better since then. So if Lindsay Lohan falls down and gets drunk on Friday, she might be in rehab by, you know, a week from Saturday. So I don't really have a, right. a joke then. I can. So you don't arrive in Canada and sort of ask what's going on with the mayor, who's the popular politician, no. so that you can insert that into your, your routine? No. If I insert anything, it'll be what happened. Like I really did get here, and the driver that picked me up almost hit a truck on the freeway. 
because uh, she was talking sorry, so much. That's not funny. I yeah. Swear, sorry. No, it was very funny because she was talking and wouldn't stop talking. And then she goes, oh, I'm so bad at talking and driving and then continued to talk. And I was like, well, that's <laughs> maybe one thing you could stop doing. Right, right. Because um, we almost hit a truck. So I will incorporate just something that happened to me just so, to let them know I'm here, I'm in the moment. But I also see it as a show where... You know, you don't go pay money to see a touring ballet company and then before they start dancing, they come out and do like the traditional Toronto <laughs> dance of something. Like they have a yes. thing to do. We for do you. have the traditional Toronto <laughs> dance. <laughs> you know yeah. they but I feel like also with Twitter, um, everyday people that aren't comedians can make the same jokes that we can. And everybody's thought of it, I feel like. And <laughs> right. what am, I'm not going to say anything funnier than that. Right. Than has been said about Rob Sort Ford. of, except for the fact that, you know, especially when you come from away, like you do, this yeah. American comedian comes to, uh, there, it, there's somehow, it feels like some kind of validation or gratification for the audience when they hear a local reference, right? Oh, okay, okay. Well, maybe I'll she throw knows in like about a, our, you know, St. Lawrence Market or something. Right? I'll say Starbucks. I'll just pretend I don't yes, know that that's that's everywhere. very good. A good local <laughs> reference. Thank but you. But I would say too, like I always say, people always think I'm really personal, but. God, there's so much stuff I don't tell on stage that is ah. the juicy stuff, but I I can't, you know. So it's well, let was, me let me get into that because yeah. I'm gonna, I'm going to ask you what uh, I mean. You know, a number of comics, including Louis Louis C.K., have argued that the only radical gesture left in comedy is to be intensely personal. Yeah, and you are quite personal. Many of your, of your jokes about are about life choices you've made, how sometimes people don't approve of them. A large part of your first book was about being a childless adult. Yeah. Right? Um, do you find that people still judge you for not having children? Yes. My orthodontist just did three weeks ago. And I know you're like, why do you have an orthodontist at age 40? But I, I had a, my teeth just like went through an adolescence again. Sure, they, they yeah, moved. as they do. Yeah. yeah. And so I was, uh, he, we were trying to make another appointment. And I'm not, he, we have an opposite schedule. And I was like, I'm going to be out of town for months. And he said, well, why? And I said, because of stand-up. He said, you're still doing that? And I said, yes, that's right. my job. And he goes, what do you do? Like, go to a city and then stay for a few days? And then that ruins your whole weekend. I said, well, I don't work on the normal weekend system, so I'm not sad right. that I'm not at a barbecue right. on yes. Sunday afternoon. And so he said, you know, this is fun for now, but you might eventually want to have a real life. And uh, he said, you might regret not having a family someday. Wow. And I said... This is a lot to get into. It's very paternal or patronizing, depending he, on how well, you take it. Well, he's 10 yeah. years younger than me, so I think <laughs> right, patronizing right. is the word. And uh, so then I said, I wrote a book about it, which I thought would stop. I thought that's <laughs> going to be my thing, and it's never worked so far. And then, then it gets into people don't even think, was it published? I'm like, yes, I didn't just sit. And there's not a book just on my computer. Like, I mean, I, <laughs> that's my thing. I right. don't have kids. How uh, is your yeah. orthodontist completely unaware of, you, of who you are? Oh, nobody knows who I am. Well, I'm in L.A., so it's like, you <laughs> right, know, right, okay. no, 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 no. They wander through the world unnoticed, it, which is great. But, um, yeah, no, so, yeah, he said that, and he just kept arguing it with me. And then it turned out that he had just been broken up with by a woman uh, well, who wanted to travel the world mm. instead of have a family. So I hate to say this about other people because I, don't, I really, truly try not to judge but if they're harping on me too much, it's got to mean something about th their own lives, I think. Sure. But I don't want to, that, that would be hypocritical of me to judge them back. So, but I'm just putting it out there. Mm -hmm. It's a possibility if I were to play psychiatrist. Many of the jokes on that record are, are about your, your marriage. You've since then gotten divorced. I would say that album, <laughs> I should have called it Cry for Help. That album was recorded just a mere four months before my marriage did dissolved. The, did the album contribute to the dissolution of the marriage? No, but I do think it contributed to, uh, even though my husband and I both wanted to get divorced, I think it contributed to some latent uh, upsetment that came up in him during the divorce proceedings. Or I think he Upsetment. Yeah, upsetment, let's Excellent. say that. Yeah. I think he was like, you know, I never really appreciated being in your act. Right. And I tried the whole excuse of it's a form of love and it's a thing. But I really think in that particular album, I was so unaware that I was with the wrong person for me and that I wasn't happy about it. Like that you so thought it was okay to joke about it. I thought it was yeah. okay to joke about it. I thought no one really ends up with someone that's right for them, but it turned out the things I was talking about were actually things that were weirdly important to me. I have a really dumb bit about <laughs> just him packing the wrong clothes for a trip. <laughs> And I know it sounds stupid, but little things like that inform a lot of different things. We just had different styles how, how and, does and it, interests. Does it help you to make jokes? I mean, you now you make jokes about being divorced, about yeah. having uh, getting a divorce. Is that somehow, is it just fodder for comedy or is it somehow therapeutic for you? 
No, my therapy is my only therapeutic thing. Because this that's what I mean. I don't go that deep. The stuff I work out, it, you know, with the divorce material is, it's more intellectually cathartic where I I feel like maybe I'm showing people who still are afraid of the word divorce, which I can't believe so many people still are, mm. that it's okay. I feel like I'm speaking on behalf of divorce people. Could you please stop lowering your voice at parties and asking if we're okay? Mm. You know, and Louis right. C.K.'s bit about it is the greatest. So, uh, so it's not really therapeutic. It's more validating. I like to find the other divorced people in the audience. It's, mm. it's excitement, but all the stuff I had to figure out, why did I get married? Blah, 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 blah. That's all stuff for my therapist that would never be funny. Now, if, if be a you, great one woman show, but not be funny. Back to your husband saying, your ex-husband yeah. saying that, um, uh, he, he didn't love being insinuated into your, into your comedy. If, if a lot of what you do around your personal life does mm -hmm. involve someone else. Yeah. Like, do you ever worry about someone not wanting to get involved with you because they know that they might end up as part of your routine? Uh, well, now they wouldn't because I learned a lesson from that. Okay. That, especially as a comedian that happens to be female, I try to stay away from negative against any man that I'm with. I, I That's why I call uh, that album should be called Cry for Help because I don't think I would ever do that again. Um, I would talk about it from a very different perspective where you might not even know if I am in a relationship or not. I would just talk about what I'm like in general, you know, that kind of thing. Like I have a new bit I'm working on about having age appropriate sex, you know, as opposed to dating younger people just because I'm 40 and divorced and don't want to be that. So that could be, that bit could work out whether I am with someone, whether I'm not, right. you know, you don't know who it is. You don't know anything. So, and it's about me. It's well, that, never that, about them. That segues into a callback from what I was going to, something you mentioned earlier in the interview that I, was, I wanted to bring back, which is, which is where won't you go? What, where is the line for you in terms of what you don't want to talk about? That's a great way of getting out what I'm not talking about. Um, I wouldn't uh, name anyone romantically. I wouldn't talk about anyone's faults or flaws, friend, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I won't talk about specific family members' problems, that that kind of thing. What about yourself? What, oh, what, is, what is there about you that you don't? You, where's I the mean, line in terms I, of? I would be fine saying anything as long as it's funny. I just know some stuff isn't funny. So, so like talking about the marriage thing, figuring out why I got married. Well, I had anxiety and panic disorder my whole life, and I was really broke at a certain point. And I really thought my life, I mean, this wasn't all cognizant at the time, but looking back, I think myself and this person were both at these crossroads in our lives that we thought, you know, it'd be a, a heck of a lot easier to have someone else through it all with, with us. Right. So we got together and helped each other kind of grow up. So that there's nothing funny about that. So I wouldn't bring that on stage. I'm not ashamed of it, but that's why it's not on stage because it's just not funny. And it's hindsight. I wasn't, you don't want to sound like a terrible person and leave the audience walking out going, she got married because she had a panic attack sometimes and didn't have any money. It's like, no, no, no. I'm just saying, looking back, I think that's what happened and right. that kind of thing. So that kind of stuff is so messy and not funny. That's why I don't go there. But it's there. But you know? you're ready to serve the humor. If 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 something's funny, you'll talk about it. If something's funny, I'll talk about, about it. About you. About me, yeah. This um, You're working on a sitcom for FX about a character who sounds kind of like you. Oh, no, that whole project's dead. <laughs> oh, that's dead? I forgot dead. to tell them. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, 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 well, don't Is it be... good that it's dead? Oh, no, no, it's very good that okay. it's dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but that was a year ago. They, they bought the script, and it was really exciting, and that was an, an honor, and it just didn't get picked up. But everything is good, and... It was a, a blessing in many, many ways. How was it a blessing? Um, uh, I, I, I believe that when I look back on what I wrote, I'm not that into it. So I'd love to do, um, uh, I'm writing another book. And so I would like it to be more based on this book. And I'd like to kind of get done with the book first and then revisit what a show about me would look like. Can I you think, tell us the subject area of your new book? Um, divorce and being 40 and an unconventional adult and all that kind of thing. So I think um, this sitcom was very, even though it was for FX, it was still very sitcom -y. Mm. Like, here are the five characters in my family. And I always say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why are my parents main characters? I have some funny stories about mm. them, but I don't see them every day. Nobody sees their parents every day. So I would want my show to be a little more unconventional than the one I wrote. So in a way, it's kind of a blessing that I can now revisit it maybe, you know, in a year or something after I've finished this. 
I'm so happy book. to have you here. I would, oh, I, thank I mean, you. I mean, <laughs> you're, you. You've written this best-selling book. You've had a few viral YouTube hits with Drunk <laughs> History. You, 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 you had a TV deal that was that informative about your new book. Um, do you feel like you're at the place you've wanted to be? Yes, I feel like I wouldn't have appreciated this place when I was younger, but I really wanted it 15 years ago. I had more energy 15 years ago, but I, it's a good place. Yeah, this is where I need to be, especially if I am, am doing personal comedy. I have a lot more to talk about now than I ever did, so I hope it keeps going. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having have me. Have a good time. In, do, I will do, not do, have a good time Do in learn Toronto. the Toronto dance, the traditional <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cultural ethnic Toronto I'll dance. I'll be opening with that tonight. <laughs> I have a show at 7.